Okay, how's everybody doing? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, research election writer. Uh, it is Wednesday, May 1st, 2019. So I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, we should be live. Just run into uh, some technical difficulties here. So we should be on. So everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page and uh, invite your friends to tune in also. Okay, so I wanna deal with this, um, this piece of history. And I saw an article from uh, history.com, official website of the History Channel on April 30th, 2019, dealing with the Louisiana Purchase, okay? And how the Louisiana Purchase ties into the history of the Haitian Revolution. So that's what we're going to talk about. All right, let me uh, monitor the sound here. All right, and then uh, African American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. Invite your friends to tune in also, okay? I mean, I'm sorry, uh, African American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. As well, email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. Okay, so um, April 30th was the um, anniversary of the uh, Louisiana Purchase Treaty. And when we learn about the Louisiana Purchase in school, and I've talked about it in some of my lectures, we usually don't deal with how the Haitian Revolution ties into uh, the Louisiana Purchase, okay? And also, um, it, also, what oftentimes is not talked about is how the Louisiana Purchase increased the demand for slavery and the demand for enslaved Africans as well, okay? So there was a, a, a commercial for a bank. I can't remember which uh, bank it was, but um, they were reenacting the Louisiana Purchase and they had a smartphone and they had the app and it said $15 million, okay? And uh, it, it was somebody, I guess, who was uh, Thomas Jefferson saying, hey, the money has been transferred and they show $15 million. Well, so the Louisiana Purchase occurred between uh, the U.S. and France in 1803. And it was for the amount of uh, $15 million, okay? Approximately $15 million. If we look at it, a, uh, look at the article from uh, History.com, uh, the, the, uh, the Louisiana Purchase was driven by a slave rebellion. The Louisiana Purchase was driven by a slave rebellion. Uh, Napoleon was eager to sell, but the Purchase would end up expanding slavery in the U.S., okay? And it talks about this history. So when we look at this, we see that the Louisiana Purchase was one of uh, history's greatest bargains, a chance for uh, the United States to buy what what uh, promised to be one of France's largest and wealthiest territories and eliminate a European threat in the process. But the purchase was also fueled by a slave revolt in Haiti, better known as the Haitian Revolution. And tragically, it ended up expanding slavery in the United States. So if it had not been for these Haitians beating the hell out of Napoleon and, and the French, um, most likely France would not have sold uh, 828,000 square miles of land for less than three cents an acre. This is how much they got the Louisiana Purchase for, okay? Um, and this was a hell of a deal for the U.S., okay? And it's going to double the territory of the U.S. at the time also. Okay, so let's continue here. All right, so it would have seemed unthinkable for France to cede any of its colonial territory before 1791. Uh, the superpower had built a vast network of colonies in the Americas, capitalizing on European tastes for coffee, okay, indigo, and other commodities. None of these held a candle, though, to sugar, which dominated French colonial holdings. And Saint Dominique, uh, 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 in uh, Saint Domingue, uh, which is now known as Haiti, okay, uh, was one of the great sugar capitals of the world. 
All right, you also see it as St. Dominique as well. Now, a full, uh, no, no, it's important, it's important to understand. Haiti was discovered by Christopher Columbus in 1494 or, or uncovered by Columbus. It was a Spanish territory first, okay? He called it uh, Hispaniola. And it's, <clears throat> excuse me, and it's going to fall into the hands of the French. And you're going to see this with different uh, territories because the Spanish, the French, the Portuguese were constantly fighting over these new lands that they were conquering. Okay, so if we look at, um, for instance, uh, Jamaica. Jamaica was um, a, a Spanish territory Columbus discovered in, uh, or uncovered, conquered in one of his four voyages. And then in about 1655, it's going to fall into the hands of the British. Okay, this is Jamaica. So we're going to see this take place. These European nations have been fighting and killing each other for hundreds of years, going back to when they were kingdoms. Before they become nations, they were kingdoms, and you had groups of Germanic people, the Vandals, the Visigoths, the Anglos, the Saxons, the Jutes, the Lombards, the Franks, the Alans, the Picts. You had these groups of Germanic people who were also collectively called barbarians, and they're fighting and killing each other for hundreds of years. Then they're going to be formed into nations, and they continue to fight and kill each other for hundreds of years. So when we look at the transatlantic slave trade, um, when uh, well, if you go back before um, back before then, um, we, we look at the uh, when the Moors go into the Iberian Peninsula in 711 AD. It wasn't called Spain and Portugal; it was the Iberian Peninsula. Later, it's going to be called Spain and Portugal. When we look at the transatlantic slave trade starting with the Portuguese, uh, they start in, uh, that, that starts in uh, right about 1440. The Portuguese, Portuguese were the first ones involved in the transatlantic slave trade, and the uh, Spanish are going to be right behind them. And when you look at Spain and Portugal on a map, you see Spain and Portugal are right next to each other, okay? And it's right above Morocco. And the Moors are largely going uh, into Spain and Portugal from Morocco, okay? So the, these Europeans had a history of fighting and killing each other for hundreds and hundreds of years. This continues into World War I, this continues into World War II, okay? Things like this, all right? So we just had to understand this, this background information. The Franks are gonna go into, uh, the Franks uh, are go, go into an area that later becomes known as France. The Anglos and Saxons, they go into what becomes known as England. England is named after the Anglos, okay? The Anglos and the Saxons were two groups of Germanic people, two groups of barbarians. The Anglos and the Saxons end up coming to Jamestown, Virginia in 1607 in the US, okay? All right, so we have to, we have to understand some of this background information. Let's continue. Okay, everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page, invite your friends to tune in also. I'm not sure why it's not letting me pin this, uh, the title, I posted the title here. I'm not sure why it's not letting me pin the title to the, uh, to the broadcast. We'll try it a different way here. And African American business owners also post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. We'll let you know how uh, you can advertise the African History Network. Uh, we have a few spots left. We have four new advertisers. So uh, you're here about those as well. Let's continue here. All right, now, when we look at sugar, okay, before cotton became king, the king crop, and we know that England dominated with the cotton crop, sugar was king, okay? So as, as a full 40% of Britain and France's sugar and 60% of his coffee was produced in Haiti, and the lucrative market lent itself to a particularly brutal slave trade. So conditions in Haiti were extremely brutal. Now in the documentary, 1804, from director Tariq Nasheed, it talks about how the lifespan uh, in Haiti for uh, an enslaved African was only about seven years, okay? I've, I've seen some variances uh, dealing with that, and it 
may have something to do also with what period of time you're talking about. But when we deal with sugar, um, the Moors are going to introduce sugar into Europe in either 9th or 10th century. Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay talks about this. And Dr. Jose, Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay also has a essay in the uh, fantastic book by, uh, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertima called Golden Age of the Moor, Golden Age of the Moor. And this book deals with the Moors during the medieval times in Europe. And it has essays from Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay, Renoko Rashidi, uh, Dr. Wayne Chandler, Jan Carew, uh, Dr. John G. Jackson, a number of our scholars. Okay, so this is a fantastic book, Golden Age of the Moor. Uh, but in one of his uh, lectures that I've seen, Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay talked about how uh, the Moors introduced cotton and sugar into uh, Europe, and especially Spain, in the ninth and 10th centuries. Okay. And what's going to happen is, and uh, Professor Kaba Kamenei talks about this also, formerly known as Booker T. Coleman, is one of my teachers. Um, they talk about how the, um, the, the Moors introduce sugar, and you have Europeans who get hooked on sugar. Because we know sugar is also a drug. We know sugar grow, comes from the sugar cane. And sugar cane grows in, uh, you need warm climates, especially tropical climates, to grow sugar cane. So what happens is when Columbus is setting sail on his four voyages, he, he set sail August 3rd, 1492, on the Nina de and Santa Maria. One of the things Columbus is looking for is another source of sugar, okay, because um, a lot of Europeans have gotten hooked on sugar. So when, they, when Columbus uncovers these areas, the Bahamas, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Haiti, Jamaica, when he covers these areas, they're setting up these large sugarcane plantations there to produce the produce this crop, okay? Uh, and this is going to become a cash cow, and this becomes huge business for the Spanish, for the French, for the British, okay? Be, before cotton really becomes king. Okay, so let's continue here. Uh, so a full 40% of Britain and France's sugar and 60% of his coffee was produced in Haiti, and the lucrative market lent itself to a particularly brutal slave trade. A slave's life in Haiti was usually cut, was usually short and miserable. So, so many slaves died of yellow fever and ill treatment that the entire slave population turned over every 20 years. And slaves, enslaved Africans were held in subjugation through a strict caste system. Uh, though there were 10 um, African slaves for every white person in Haiti, slaves occupied the bottom rung of society and were treated like expendable commodities, okay? And when we look at the, the, the history of the Haitian Revolution, we see this take place. And we're gonna see that the Haitian Revolution was influenced by the French Revolution of 1789 also, okay? All right, so we have Aprella, who we have here? We have uh, Aprella, we have John, how you doing, John? Uh, St uh, Stephen, just a few of the people. Okay, check out his business business page, Culturally Vigilant, Culturally Vigilant. All right, with social media, is that on all social media platforms, Culturally, culturally Vigilant? And um, African-American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. Email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. Customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. Our current promotion is uh, get three months for the price of one. We, we can have you up and running today. Get three months for the price of one. Okay, so let's continue here. All right, so... Um, Haiti, so Haiti's free uh, black population or free African population continued to organize, okay, in spite of the slavery that was taking place. Uh, they were inspired by uh, Republican ideas of liberty, fraternity, and equality. They pressed for their rights, and some were even given the right to vote in 1790 by the French government. But when the colonial government back in uh, Saint Dominique, um, refused to recognize the law, the groundwork was laid for violence and revolt. So in 1791, the storm broke and thousands of slaves revolted, 
so we know this um, August 22nd, 20, the night of August 22nd going into August 23rd, 1791, the Haitian Revolution starts. The revolution brought the colony uh, to a state of insurrection and civil war as enslaved Africans killed their masters and occupied and burned their plantations, white people defended themselves, then fled. The social order of the island crumbled and in an attempt to stop the violence, France abolished slavery. Under the leadership of Toussaint Louverture, uh, enslaved Africans took over the entire island of Hispaniola, including St. Dominique and its neighbor, Santo Domingo. Okay, so when you look at um, uh, when we look at Nat Turner and the Nat Turner Rebellion of 1831, if you read before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr., it talks about how Nat Turner's mother is believed came from Haiti and was Haitian. Her master and she flee Haiti in the 1790s during the Haitian Revolution. And when you study Nat Turner, his mother taught him to hate slavery. When he was a boy, his mother taught him to hate slavery. Okay, the real history of Nat Turner is different than what was depicted in Nate Parker's movie, uh, The Birth of a Nation. And this is not an attack on Nate Parker. Uh, I'm glad he made the movie because people have been trying for decades to actually make a Nat Turner movie for a the theatrical movie. Um, but the real history of Nat Turner is different. Now, if you read the uh, book, now Nate Parker put out a companion book, uh, which is, a he put out a book called The Birth of a Nation. This was a companion, this is the official movie tie-in. So Nate Parker put this book out at the time the movie came out. And this is a companion to the actual movie, okay? The Birth of a Nation. And there's a chapter in here with, that deals with uh, that deals with history, and it's by uh, Dr. Dana uh, Ramey Berry and um, Dr. Uh, what's the sister's name? I just saw. I just met her. Erica Armstrong Dunbar. Okay, it's called the Unbroken Chain of Enslaved African uh, Resistance and Rebellion. Okay, the Unbroken Chain of Enslaved African Resistance and Rebellion. So this is a chapter of his book by two African-American female historians, Erica, Dr. Erica Armstrong Dunbar and Dr. Dana Ramey Berry. And that breaks down a lot of the background history of uh, Nat Turner. This is uh, the cover of the book again, The Birth of a Nation, Nat Turner and the Making of a Movement, edited by Nate Parker. This is the official movie tie-in. And there's also background information on the making of the movie, things like this, what, what they had to go through, what he had to go through to make the movie, a time when uh, on the set, uh, a storm was, was brewing. And he said they literally prayed that storm away because if that storm hit, it would have interrupted the, the filming. They would have had to close shop that day. They would have lost the money they had invested. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, he went through a lot to get that movie made. Okay. All right. So, um, okay. So we have uh, Jay Sidney. We have Steven, a few people watching. Okay. Just a few of the people watching. Everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also. All right. Let's continue here. Okay. So, um, what I leave off. Okay, so 1791, the Haitian Revolution starts August 22nd, August 23rd. Blackpass.org has a good article dealing with the Haitian Revolution and some background information. Uh, in the 18th century, Saint Dominique, uh, as as Haiti was then known, became uh, France's wealthiest overseas colony, largely because of its production of sugar, coffee, indigo, and cotton generated by enslaved labor enslaved Africans. When the French Revolution broke out in 1789, there were five distinct sets of interest groups in the colony. There were white planters who owned the plantations and the slaves, and petite blancs who were artisans, shopkeepers, and teachers. Some of them also owned a few slaves. Together, they numbered 40,000 of the colony's residents. Many of 
the, uh, many other white people in St. Dominique beca began um, to support an independence movement that began when France imposed uh, steep tariffs on the items imported into the colony, okay? The planters were extremely disenchanted with France because they were forbidden to trade with any other nation. Furthermore, the white population of St. Dominique did not have any representation in France. Despite their calls for independence, both the planters and Petit Blancs remained committed to the institution of slavery. The three remaining groups were of African descent, those who were free, those who were slaves, and those who had run away, also called Maroons, oftentimes called Maroons. We saw the Maroons in Jamaica with people like Queen Nanny and the Jamaica Maroons. We see the Maroons in Spanish territory, like Florida as well. Now, there were about 30,000 free black people in 1789. Half, half of them were mulatto, and often they were wealthier than the petite blancs. Okay, now the slave population was close to, uh, so the enslaved African population was close to 500,000. The runaway slaves were called Maroons. They had, they had um, retreated deep into the mountains of St. Dominique and lived off uh, subsistence farming. Now, Haiti uh, had a history of slave rebellions. The slaves were never willing to submit to their status. And with their strength and numbers, they outnumbered, them, outnumbered the Europeans 10 to 1. Colonial officials and planters did all that was possible to control these, these enslaved Africans. Now, despite the harshness and cruelty of St. Dominique's slavery, okay, they were uh, 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 there were slave rebellions before 1791, okay, as well. All right, so that's just a little, um, that's just a little background information they're dealing with uh, Haiti, okay, and what's going on, St. Dominique. Now, uh, okay, so Napoleon could not abide the idea of the island of St. Dominique being controlled by former slaves. Behind the scenes, he plotted to take the island back over, to take the island back over and reinstitute slavery. But when French forces invaded Haiti in an attempt to restore the original order, the slave rebellion refused to budge. They burned cities, used guerrilla warfare, and killed thousands of Europeans, okay? Now, France was in shock, and Napoleon began to realize that his dream of a French empire in the Americas might be doomed. He planned to send troops to Louisiana, Louisiana here in this country, he, because that was French territory, okay? He planned to send troops to Louisiana to take over the colony, which he had uh, received from the Spanish through a secret treaty in 1800, in the hopes of using the territory as a trade venue for the commodities produced in Haiti the coffee, the sugar, the indigo, the cotton, things like this. But if Haiti was under the control of African slaves, his plan was, would not come to fruition. And we look at them getting, we look at the French getting Louisiana from the Spanish, okay? Because see the Spanish territory, you had South Carolina, what we call South Carolina. Now, I don't know what the Spanish called it, but this, keep in mind, see, 2019, August, see, so this year, a lot of people are talking about August 20th, 2019, August 20th, 1619, and August 20th, 2019 being the 400th year anniversary of enslaved Africans coming to this country. Now, even though that did happen, the 29 Africans who came on the White Lion slave ship, who originally uh, came from Angola, they were captured by the Portuguese. The Portuguese slave ship called the uh, San Juan Batista was hijacked around the coast of Mexico, around Mexico. It was hijacked by English pirates. And you're gonna have um, about uh, 50 enslaved Africans put on two English ships, one called the White Lion, the other called the Treasury. And those ships come into Jamestown, Virginia in August of 1619 and they're uh, the 
enslaved Africans on the White Lion ship, there's about 20 of them, are going to be traded by, by the captain for uh, food and supplies, water, things like this. So even though that did happen, Afri African slaves were in this country uh, it, the land that we call the United States of America, the Spanish would take in Africans into the territory called South Carolina in the 1520s, especially 1526. So that's not the first time that African slaves came to this land, August 20, 1619. Even though August 20, 1619 did happen, people don't talk about the Spanish. And the Spanish are taking Africans into Florida, they're taking them into these Spanish territories, Florida, South Carolina, things like this, Louisiana. Okay, now, if we look at um, Dr. David M. Hotep's book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence, his book came out in 2011. His book has 713 footnotes. It thoroughly documents an African presence in this country that we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years ago. These were the Khoisan. The Khoisan had the oldest DNA on the planet. They're the ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa. The Twa are derisively or pejoratively called in European uh, anthropology and archaeology, uh, derisively called pygmies. But these are the short statured people who go all around the world and they have the oldest DNA on the planet. And they were here as well for tens of thousands of years. So we have to understand that you have migrations that happen at different periods of time for different reasons. And, and when you have the Khoisan here, you know, they're building pyramid mounds up and down the Mississippi River. He deals with all this in his book. This is before Native Americans come into existence. This is before the people who we call Native Americans come into existence. The people who we call Native Americans are actually the offspring of the intermixing of Africans who were already here and Asians who come here around 3000 BC, their offspring are who we call Native Americans. Now this is not to take anything away from Amer Native Americans, we just have to understand the history. Uh, when you look at old, and I got, uh, I have a book, but it's down at the bottom of the stack and I don't have time to get it right now. But when we look at old black and white photographs of Native Americans, these were usually a dark skinned people, oftentimes high cheekbones. These were not the very, very light-skinned, almost white-looking Native Americans that you see today, okay? And if we look at page, if we look at page 67 of his book, this is a deep book here. It's out of print. You may be able to find it at your local African-American bookstore. I got to call Dr. David M. Hotel because his, uh, his new book is coming out any month now, The First Americans Were Africans Revisited, okay? But just very quickly. If we look at page 65 of this book, we look at page 65 of this book, and it has a section here, section E, John Smith and Black Indians, okay? John Smith and Black Indians, Captain John Smith, all right? He says, in 1607, the Englishman, Captain John Smith, built the first permanent Caucasian settlement in North America in Jamestown, Virginia. While building the settlement, Captain John Smith made contact with the Powhatan tribe, okay? the Powhatan Native American tribe. He goes on to say the Powhatans were part of the Algonquin speakers who were the largest group of Indians in Virginia as, as late as, uh, as late as the time Captain John Smith arrived. There were more than 10,000 Algonquin uh, in Virginia alone before the colonists, uh, before the colonists arrived. Quote, Europeans called Delaware Indians redskins because of their reddish natural complexion and the vermilion makeup they were fond of and decorated their bodies, end quote. Therefore, they were unfortunately called redskins and sometimes called red devils by the European settlers, also referring to their skin tone. In 1607, Captain John Smith described the chief of the Powhatans, writing, quote, Powhatan, more like a devil than a man with some 200 more as black as himself, end quote. When Captain John Smith described the chief indirectly saying his braids were as black as he was, 
it is logical to assume that he too was black. When John Smith described the Powhatans as devils and black, he was referring to skin tone. Dr. Clyde Winters agrees saying, quote, early Americans would certainly be able to tell the difference between paint and complexion, end quote. In any case, whether the Powhatans were black at, the, at that late date or not does not change the fact that the first Americans were Africans. These first Americans remained black complexion until 3000 BC when the first Asians entered and began to mix blood with the proto-American Africans. Okay, that's page 65 and 66 of the first Americans were Africans documented evidence by Dr. David M. Hotel, okay? All right, how's everybody doing? Miranda, Maisha, uh, we got Sonia, uh, just a few of the people watching. What's the name of that book? The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence. Okay, but Dr. David M. Hotel, no relation to me. He's a friend of mine. I've interviewed him 11 times. You can go listen to the interviews I've done with him. Uh, they're at our... They're podcasted at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. They're podcasted there. Click on Listen to Podcasts right on the homepage, and uh, you can search for David M. Hotep. I interviewed him 11 times at least. Okay. If you all like this type of information, you can donate to the African History Network as well, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, or you can go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, click on the yellow Donate button. That helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, pay the bills, buy these books, pay for the paper, the ink, all this stuff, okay? That helps us to finance our Sunday night show, the African History Network show as well. And then also, I teach an online course that's on demand, where I deal with thousands of years of history. It's called Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, What They Didn't Teach You in School. That's a 14-hour, seven-session online course. We, uh, we have that within a 10 course online bundle pack right now. All the classes are on demand and um, it's on sale $40, regularly $130. And I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have video clips, book references, everything. Okay, so we just posted the link for that. If you like this type of information, the online course will blow you away. And it's also on the homepage of our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com as well. Okay. Then also check out Golden Age of the Moor. These are some of the books I use in the online course that I reference in the online course. Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivor Van Sertema also. Okay, let's continue. Uh, okay, we have Patrick, we have Gary, uh, just a few of the people. And you know what? I forgot to share this on my own personal page. I'm telling everybody to share it. I forgot to share it on my personal page as well. <laughs> Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. All right, so just a second here. Let me share this and then we'll continue here. All right, so this is moving slowly. Okay, I got about 50 tabs open in uh, Firefox. Okay, I've been doing a lot of research today. All right, so let's continue here. Okay, so, um, so we're dealing with Napoleon Bonaparte. We know Lapo Napoleon also conquers Egypt in 1798 as well. If you want to read Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder, Browder talks about. Uh, Browder talks about uh, Napoleon in uh, Egypt, okay, 1798, the French conquered Egypt. But um, so French forces invaded Haiti in an attempt to uh, restore the original order. The slave rebellion refused to budge. They burned cities, used guerrilla warfare, and killed thousands of Europeans. Now, uh, France was in shock. And Napoleon began to realize that his dream of a French empire in the Americas might be doomed. He planned to send troops to, uh, he had planned to send troops to Louisiana to take over the colony, which he had received from the Spanish through a secret treaty in the year 1800, in hopes of using uh, the territory as a trade venue for the commodities produced in Haiti. Okay, he's trying to raise money, it sounds like. But if Haiti was under the control of enslaved Africans, his plan would not come to fruition. Now, Thomas Jefferson, President Thomas Jefferson, and his cabinet 
themselves terrified of a French presence so close to the United States use this conundrum as an opening. Uh, they approached uh, the French with the offer to buy New Orleans, a port city of vital significance to America, to American trade, uh, that they worried about France owning. Okay, because Louisiana, New Orleans, that's all French territory. To their surprise, France offered, to their surprise, France offered to sell them the entire territory of Louisiana instead. Okay, so with the Louisiana purchase, the U.S. gets 828,000 square miles of land for less than three cents an acre. They're, they cut, they carve out about 15 states out of this land that they get from France because the Haitians are kicking their behinds to Saint Louis Overture and Bookman Dada, uh, Jean Jacques Dessalines. Because of the Haitian Revolution, it causes France to sell this land to the U.S. It doubles the territory of the U.S. at that time. Okay. Now, here's what, here is a picture of what they got. Here is what the territory looks like. Let me uh, do a screen share here so you can see this. Okay. I don't know why this ads here on the sign showing feet, showing this advertising shoes, I guess. And then let me try to blow this up here as well. Let's zoom in. Okay, so you can see this. All right. So we see here in the middle. Louisiana purchased Louisiana territory, okay? Louisiana purchased 1803. So they're getting all this land for 800, for uh, uh, about $15 million, okay? It's about 15 million. And this doubles the territory of the United States at the time, okay? At this time, California is not part of um, the U.S., okay? Um, California becomes part of the U.S. because of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo of 1848. Uh, California, Arizona, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, and Nevada. They're not part of the U.S. at this time. That they, they become part of the U.S. Uh, or territories of the U.S. in 1848. This is 1803, okay? Um, things like uh, Alaska and uh, Hawaii, that comes about 1959, all right? Now, what's going to happen is, is that because of the Louisiana Purchase, it's going to give the U.S. more land to grow, crop, to grow crops on, and it's going to increase the need and the demand for enslaved Africans, okay? And this is before the U.S. Congress outlawed the importation of African slaves uh, into this country. That happens January 1st, 1808, okay? Let me turn off the screen share. That happens January 1st, 1808, okay? You're all familiar with this. You've heard me talk about this, right? This is one of the legal arguments for slavery. This is one of the legal arguments for Reparations. A lot of these arguments, people, people are floating around for reparations. You know, we work for 246 years for free U.S. 14 trillion dollars, right? Okay. Let me ask you a question. Who has? How you doing, Wendell? You all right? Hotel to you. Who has actually studied the history of slavery? Post some of the names of the books you've read dealing with the history of slavery in this country. Post who who has actually studied the history of slavery? Okay, this is a this is a pop quiz. Okay, read the U.S. Constitution. Go to loc.gov. Read the U.S. Constitution. Read Article One, Section Nine of the U.S. Constitution. Article One, Section Nine of the U.S. Constitution ties into why the international slave trade was made illegal. Because at the Philadelphia Convention of 1787, spring of 1787, when they're drafting the Constitution, debating about what's going to be in it, etc the issue of slavery comes up and you have some who are for abolishing slavery you have others who want to maintain slavery <clears throat> the delegates at the at the philadelphia convention some of them are slave owners who draft the u.s constitution now all of them were not slave owners but some of them were slave owners who drafted the u.s constitution or and who drafted and signed it okay like thomas jefferson we know thomas jefferson wrote the majority of the constitution he was a slave owner okay um 
But Article 1, Section 9 stipulates that the importation of enslaved Africans would be outlawed after 20 years. They decided to allow a 20-year period of time to keep bringing Africans into this country as slaves. They stipulated that the earliest it could be outlawed would be 1808. This is in Article 1, Section 9 of the U.S. Constitution. A lot of people don't know this history. So March 2nd of 1807, the U.S. Congress passes a law to ban the importation of enslaved Africans. History.com has an article about this. Okay, History.com is a really good source, official website of the History Channel. I mean, these are white people telling you this stuff. Okay, uh, they have an article here, Congress abolishes the African slave trade. Okay, uh, Congress abolishes the African slave trade, 1807. And it go that law goes into effect January 1st, 1808, because that's the earliest that it could go into effect based upon Article 1, Section 9 of the U.S. Constitution. Unfortunately, most of our people, most, most, most Americans don't understand the U.S. Constitution, number one. Americans are woefully ignorant of history and law. And we have to study the U.S. Constitution, especially if we ever actually want to get reparations and keep it. We have to learn how to make legal arguments for this, okay? The, the book, The First Americans of Africans, Documented Evidence. Okay, so the question I ask people who has actually studied the history of slavery, post some of the, uh, name me some of the books that you've read dealing with the history of slavery in this country. Not slavery in Haiti, not slavery in Jamaica, but in, in the United States. Name me some of the books, okay? Patrick said, great work of telling them what to read to acquire knowledge. Yeah. Now we have a recommended reading list of books at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Click on book list at the top. We have a recommended reading list of 60 books. I got to add some more books to it. You know, I put it together about two days because people, when I do radio interviews, when I'm on other people's shows, when I do my show, or when I do lectures, when I travel to different cities and do lectures, people always ask me what book should I read? So I put together a book. I put together a list of recommended readings, right? Okay, uh, so I'm looking for some book titles. Okay, who's read some books done with the history of slavery? All right, I don't see any book titles. Okay, but here, let me make this easy for you, right? When you study the history of slavery in this country, where did you read that slaves were supposed to be paid? When you study the history of slavery in the history of this country, I'm not talking about in Britain, Okay, I'm talking about, but you had the British colonies and then it's going to spread. Okay, you had the British colonies, they win their independence. You had the American Revolution, 1775 to 1783. You had the US Constitution signed September 17, 1787, right? You're going to have the Bill of Rights, 1791, the first through 10th Amendments, which were not originally part of the US Constitution. The First Amendment, Second Amendment were not part of the US Constitution originally. To, uh, to amend means to change or to alter. Where did you read that slaves were supposed to be paid? So, so how could you then come, uh, what, 154 years after chattel slavery ends and say, we, our ancestors worked for 246 years, we're so, we, we want to get back paid when the whole purpose of enslaving Africans for their entire life was not to pay them and it was legal to do that. It was, see, this is why we have to understand law and history. It was legal. I ain't saying it was morally right, it was morally wrong. It was legal. This is why we have to study the U.S. Constitution, because Article 1, Section 9 lays a foundation for a legal argument for reparations, because after January 1st, 1808, they kept bringing Africans into this country. You look at the Amistad of 1839, they were able to win their freedom. Joseph St. Q. And those Africans on the Amistad, they were able to win their freedom because it was illegal for them to come into this country as slaves. Now, that wasn't an English ship, but still, it was illegal for them to come into this country. The Clotilda of 1860 in Alabama, where you had uh, uh, Kudjo Lewis and you had uh, Radoshi. These were the two. Kudjo Lewis dies in 1935. Radoshi dies in 1937. These were the last two uh, known Africans. The old, I should say the um, the the last two uh, known Africans uh, on that slave ship, 
on that slave ship. Uh, he dies in 1935, she dies in 1937. That ship was illegal coming to this country. You had cases of white men who were caught bringing Africans to this country and they were prosecuted, in some cases convicted, sent to prison because they violated, they violated federal law, okay? Uh, read the article that Dr. Jahi Issa and brother Reggie Marbury wrote for blackagendareport.com called uh, Reparations is Dead. Uh, these scholars are trying to uh, revive it, something like that. It's from uh, 2017 because I interviewed them. I did a two-part interview with them and, we're break and we were breaking down legal arguments for reparations. And it's based upon understanding that Europeans kept violating the law of the U.S. Prior to 1808, is it was legal to bring Africans into this country. After that, it's illegal, and they kept violating their laws. So, and you had white, you had white men, oftentimes, the many times, who were caught and punished for this. All right, let's continue here. The have has never been told. Yeah, that's by Edward. Uh, that's by Edward Baptist. I haven't read the book. I've read excerpts, excerpts from that book. And I've seen uh, interviews, Roland Martin interviewed him, man. So that's, that looks like a really, really good book that half has never been told. And it talks about how, how enslaved Africans, because of cotton, made, created untold wealth for the U.S. The other thing is with the, with the Louisiana Purchase, getting back to this, all this is tied together. But the other thing is, uh, uh, okay, Marquis said, when does the next class start? Okay, so the, the online classes I was talking about that I teach, they're all on demand. You can watch at your own pace. So Marquise, it starts right now. It's like as soon as you register for it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's all on demand. Watch at your own pace. You can binge watch it if you want to. Watch all around the world. All right. We just posted a link there. It's on sale $40, regularly $130. It's a 10 course online bundle pack where I go deep into this history. Um so when we deal with the Louisiana Purchase, the other thing that increased the need for slavery is not just, is not just uh, more land and fertile land at that. It's also the invention of the cotton gin in the early 1790s, right around 1793, I think it was. The cotton, cotton gin and copies of the cotton gin. What this did was increase the demand for cotton. It lowered the cost uh, of producing cotton and it was a device that removed the seeds out of the cotton it efficiently removed the seeds out of the cotton before that they the enslaved africans were doing it by hand okay so when the cotton gin is invented and then copies of the cotton gin is invented what this did was this made it more profitable to produce the cotton you could produce it faster okay and this, and then this is going to, uh, uh, and then with, then with the Louisiana Purchase, and the U.S. doubling its territory, they're carving out 15 states out of this. Okay, this increases the need for more slaves. Now they're going to try to have a balance between the number of free states and the number of slave states in this country. Okay, at this time, so. Not all of the 15 states were going to have slavery, but probably about half of them did. And this is going, and also you're going to have, um, <clears throat> later you're going to have the Missouri Compromise of 1820, which deals with that also. We'll talk about that in a minute. All right, so, uh, so Thomas Jefferson and his cabinet themselves terrified of a French presence so close to the United States used this conundrum as an opening, okay? So they offered to, uh, uh, by uh, New Orleans, a port city of vital significance to American trade uh, the, uh, that they worried about France owning. To their surprise, France offered to sell them the entire territory of Louisiana instead. Now, as France and the United States negotiated the Louisiana Purchase, Haiti became an independent country run by the victorious former slaves. But, the, uh, but though the victory eliminated slavery in Haiti, it ironically increased slavery in the country that purchased the land and had spooked France into selling, okay? The land Haiti had spooked France into selling. The Louisiana Purchase opened up a new can of worms in the United States, 
how much of the new territory should be open to slavery. So this is what I'm talking about, right? So they, they try to keep a balance between free states and slave states, okay, at this time. Okay, now we know when we go to the 13, when we go back to the 13 colonies before the American Revolution, we know there's a period of time when all 13 colonies had slavery, okay, including the colony of New York. Okay, and this is where you have uh, Wall Street and the first commodity on Wall Street were enslaved Africans. We know that the, uh, the New York, before it was the colony of New York, it was a Dutch colony called New Amsterdam, New Amsterdam okay, and about 1627. Uh, at the northern portion of that colony, they're going to have the enslaved Africans build a wall to keep Native Americans out, things like this, right? And then it's going to become the colony of New York, and that wall is where Wall Street gets its name from. And we know the first commodity traded on Wall Street were enslaved Africans. Uh, AtlantaBlackStar.com has an article dealing with... Uh, Little known facts, little known facts about Wall Street or something like that. Okay, so by doubling the size of the U.S., the uh, the purchase of of Louis, the Louisiana Purchase of eighteen o three added vast swaths of territory that pro slavery advocates argue, pro slavery advocates argue, should be filled with slaves. Okay, as farmers headed into the newly created Missouri Territory. Missouri Territory with their slaves, lawmakers tussled over the issue of which parts should have slavery. It took until 1820 for them to agree on what was known as the Missouri Compromise. And the Missouri Compromise drew an imaginary line across the new territory that separated free and slave areas. And when you study the Missouri Compromise, and the history.com has an article about this, they brought Maine which was a territory, they brought Maine into the Union also. So uh, Missouri was a slaveholding state, Maine was a free state to keep the balance, okay? Now, um, slavery was now legal in Missouri and the new state added pro-slave members to Congress. By 1860, now 1860 is the year before the Civil War. Civil War starts April 12, 1861, with the attack on Fort Sumter in South Carolina. is precipitated by uh, Abraham Lincoln becoming president-elect November 6, 1860, okay? December 20th, 1860, about six weeks after that, South Carolina becomes the first state to secede from the Union. They fear Abraham Lincoln is going to free the slaves. Abraham Lincoln is the, uh, is the candidate or president-elect coming from the Republican Party. And the Republican Party was formed by groups of ab abolitionists in 1854 to be the counter to the Democratic Party, which at the time was the party of the slaveholders, the plantation owners, things like this, All right? So you have to understand this chronology of history, okay? So by 1860, there were more than 100,000 slaves in Missouri, and slaves were valued at over $44 million in 1860, that's about $112 billion in today's dollars. Meanwhile, Louisiana, which, was also, which had also become a state after the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, remained a slave state. And New Orleans remained a critical hub of slave trade. So while a slave rebellion helped drive the Louisiana Purchase, the Haitians beating the hell out of the French, during the Haitian Revolution, the new territory was destined to become a place of suffering and exploitation for thousands of African slaves forced to work. I would say millions, probably over the course from, from 1803 on to about 1860, you're probably talking about millions. Because if you had, you probably talk over the course of that time, you're talking about millions. Okay, so that deals with some of the history of the Haitian Revolution, but the Louisiana Purchase, okay? And oftentimes when Louisiana Purchase is talked about, the connection between why France sold 828,000 square miles of land for less than three cents an acre, that's not tied to what happened in Haiti and the Haitians beating the hell out of the French. And when they defeated the French and declared their independence January 1st, 1804, 
the Spanish and the British, uh, the Spanish and the British were allies of the French. So they defeated not just the French, they defeated the Spanish and the British as well. Okay, let's uh, look at some of your comments here. How's everybody doing? And then uh, African-American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. Email us at customerservice at africanhistorynetwork.com. Customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. We'll take your 30 second and 60 second audio commercial, put into the audio podcast of our Sunday night show, the African History Network show. And then also uh, we, uh, you'll be promoted in some of the broadcasts we do throughout the week as well, okay? So we have a, we have a few more spots left. Uh, current promotion is uh, get three months for the price of one. Email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. We can get you uh, up and running today. John said it's on demand, start any time. Right, yeah, the online courses, man, I, the, the, I've, they're already recorded, they're on demand. Watch at your own pace. Uh, that's, and so we have them in a bundle pack, a 10 course online bundle pack and includes ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. That's a 14 hours, seven session online course. So you can watch all around the world, watch at your own pace and includes, it's actually, uh, it also includes great African women, the history, the mothers of civilization, an online class I did dealing with the film Black Panther, showing how the film Black Panther relates to African history and culture. Uh, language, things like that. So it's a lot in there. So we have that for a limited time only on sale, forty dollars. Okay, so uh, we'll come to some of your comments here in just a minute. Um, we know uh, Mother's Day is coming up, and um, we know that women like to be pampered. So Dark Magentas has something for you. Now, Dark Magenta specializes in creating home spa products based on nature's healing and soothing properties. Dark Magenta carries essential oil and cannabidiol infused bath bombs, shower steamers, sugar scrubs, and soaps. They include oils and herbs such as lavender, rosemary, eucalyptus, sage, cedarwood, oatmeal, shea butter, uh, and cannabidiol and more. They also carry oil diffusers and 100% pure essential oils. Visit their website, darkmagentas.com, M-A-G-E-N-T-A-S, darkmagentas.com, and indulge in these treats for the body and the mind, okay? And we know women also like shoes, right? So, and men like to take shoes off of women, right? Especially high heel shoes, I'm just saying. So the Nick Knackery Company has something for you. Now, very soul sophisticated for the soul, S O. L-E, so sophisticated for the soul. The Nick Knackery Company, a new online shoe store, is launching soon. Out of a divine love for shoes, the Nick Knackery Company was born. Their signature soles, S-O-L-E-S, are artfully handcrafted in small owned factories to bring you both timeless and on-trend shoes, which have uncompromised construction. Showering women with unique creations for their souls is their mission. These creations are for the very soul soul sophisticated woman who loves quality and uniqueness. They love their soul sisters and they look forward to serving you soon, okay? So visit their website. Uh, you can give them your email address and they let you, they'll let you know when they launch. Launch.shopnicknacks.com forward slash join us. Launch.shopnicknacks.com nicknacks.com forward slash join us. And that's nicknacks with a K. And um, we'll uh, post the link here for you uh, also, okay? All right, so we have uh, Steven with Culturally Vigilant is an unapologetic uh, streetwear brand, okay? We've got Philip. Uh, we need a course like this in all inner city schools. I agree with that. We need something like this in all inner city schools. And I encourage people to read the um, 52 page study called Teaching Hard History of American Slavery. It's in my backpack because I, I talked about it on my radio show uh, Sunday night. Teaching Hard History American Slavery. Teaching Hard History American Slavery. Now, this is a 52 page study from the Southern Poverty Law Center. Some of you all have heard me talk about it. You can download it. Uh, just go to splcenter.org, splcenter.org. It's, it's free to download. And it documents how the history of slavery 
is being incorrectly taught in our schools. And it deals with specific ways to uh, better and more accurately teach the history of slavery. Okay. And, um, it, uh, I, you know, I just did a broadcast dealing with how schools keep teaching the history of slavery and civil rights incorrectly. And they teach it in a way that traumatizes uh, African American students. Okay. And one of the things that they tell you don't do are the slave reenactments. Okay. They tell you that slave reenactments harm. Uh, African American children, and we keep hearing stories. And I just talked about them on my on my show Sunday night. We keep hearing stories about uh, teachers in schools that have slave reenactments. Okay, I'm going to post a link here to the study, and uh, let's see here. Where are we right here? I'll post a link here to the study. It's a 52 page study from the Southern Poverty Law Center called Teaching Hard History of American Slavery. Now, parents can take this study into the schools, into the teachers, into the administrators, to the school board meetings, because a lot of the teachers haven't read this. A lot of the teachers have not read this study, okay? All right, so it can help you uh, get this type of information in your child's school also, okay? Stephen, how you doing, Stephen? All right, and then who else we have here? Uh, see here Philip okay Howard abolitionist Cassius Marsalis Clay yeah Cass so Cassius Clay Muhammad Ali was named after a well-known abolitionist there in uh Kentucky abolitionist Cassius Marsalis Clay uh free his father slaves and went on to pay them okay yeah but when you study the history of slavery and it's because he he did that he, he, he went on and did that. But when you study the history of slavery in this, in this country, where do you read that slaves were supposed to be paid? This was the whole purpose of enslaving them for their entire life, okay? So we have to understand how to make legal arguments for slavery. This would be an excellent elective course during the summer, also our children, and most of us have been misled and miseducated for so long. And, and see, the thing that the um, study from the Southern, Lively, Southern Poverty Law Center talks about teaching hard history of American slavery, we posted the link here for it. So you can download it. You can read it, take it to a printer, get it printed up. They talk about how American schools in general miseducate children, not just African-American children. American schools in general miseducate children. They grow up to be adults that are miseducated, okay? Regardless of ethnicity. Most African-Americans don't understand the history of slavery. Half our people still think Willie Lynch historically existed. You know how many people get mad at me when I tell them Willie Lynch did not historically exist and provide them evidence of this? I mean, so we have all been miseducated about history. This is why you have people out defending Confederate monuments. You just had Benedict Donald, Donald Trump praising General Robert E. Lee, who was a traitor to this country, took up arms, committed treason against this country, took up arms against this country to maintain slavery. And he was a brutal slave owner also, General Robert E. Lee. This is, this is what happens when you don't understand history. Okay, all right, okay, so we have Linda, how you doing? Linda, she said, teacher, sir, Hotep, how you doing, sister? All right, so if you like this type of information, also you can donate to the African History Network, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. That helps us to keep doing the research, stay on the air, finance the Sunday night show, the African History Network show as well. And then um, we have um, one last new uh, advertiser as well. Um, our sister, Martisha Patterson, who has been a certified financial planner with over 19 years of uh, experience in the industry. We know 2019 is here and there's no better time to start working on your financial goals, right? We saw that uh, John Singleton passed away. We see his fight, his family's fighting over their estate. We see Prince died, uh, passed away three years ago. Uh, apparently no will. You know, all these things we keep seeing happening. Well, uh, certified financial planner Marticia Patterson uh, can help you with this. She's helping people just like you focus on and achieve your goals. If you need help with budgeting, saving for emergencies or retirement, if you want to start investing but don't know where to start, she is here to help. 
No need to feel alone or frustrated. No one situation is the same, which is why you need a certified financial planner like Martisha Patterson. Visit her website, pattersonplan17.com, pattersonplans, the number 1717.com. You can also email her at pattersonplan17 at gmail.com or give her a call, 646-552-4384, 646-552-4384. We'll post the uh, website information here as well. Okay, and then Linda said, enjoying my 58th life day uh, with you, Michael. Appreciate gleaning insightfulness from you. Okay, all right, happy Earth Day, happy birthday, Linda. <coughs> okay, <laughs> all right, how are you doing today? Let's see, pattersonplans17.com. Okay, and then uh, we, okay, Victoria said, what is lawful for European, was it lawful for European to enslave? indigenous people um depends upon which laws we're talking about um africans being brought here to this country and then also uh where they were stripped of their they were stripped of their nationality but they but you're operating based upon uh laws of the 13 colonies these statutes put in place massachusetts in 1641 Virginia in 1661, because when the when the 13 colonies first start, you don't have slave statutes. Those Africans that were brought in, like those, those like those first 20 uh, on the white line slave ship, they were put into indentured servitude. When you read before the Mayflower by, by Lerone Bennett Jr., he talks about this because slave statutes didn't exist at that time. I mean, this is before this is before the case of 1640 of uh john punch which was and john punch was a indentured servant who was who was black who was african who ran away with two white indentured servants and he was treated differently <clears throat> so you have to study those cases also so they're stripped of their nationality yes but when you understand the laws of these country this country because we're dealing with legal arguments for slavery because when people are talking about trying to get a bill passed, trying to have the president didn't do something, it's all based upon law. So if it's not legally signed, what's going to happen? It's going to be challenged in the courts, and it's going to be overturned in the courts. If they challenge the Affordable Health Care Act in the courts, and that saved millions of white people's lives, you think they wouldn't challenge reparations in the courts? See, this is what th these are conversations people who are pushing reparations. A lot of them, a lot of them don't want to have. I'm all for reparations, but I ain't, I'm not for deceiving our people about it. I'm, I'm talking about how do, we, how do we actually push it all the way through and keep it. I'm talking about thinking 15 moves ahead all the way to the end game, all the way to checkmate. So these are a lot of conversations people don't want to have. Okay, and then read the article from uh, that I told you, uh, written by Dr. Jahi Issa. And um, Brother Reggie Marbury also that go deep into this history. I interviewed them. We did like a, a two part interview, total about four hours. Where we deal with this, deal with this history, and deal with, and, and deal with the law. And these are things that a lot of people don't understand. A lot of people are making emotional arguments for reparations and moral arguments for reparations, but they're not making legal arguments. And this is the problem. We ain't dealing with morality, we're dealing with legality. Okay. Um, choo, choo, choo. All right. Okay, guys. So look, African American business owners, email us, customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We can let you know how you can uh, advertise with us. We can help you get uh, new businesses and uh, new, new customers, new business. and um, each one of our podcasts, our audio podcasts, are uh, listened to by thousands of people. We're on eight different podcast platforms. We're on iTunes, Blog Talk Radio, FM Player, Stitcher, CastBox. I've been doing the show for nine years, doing these broadcasts for nine years. And then also, uh, we put this video on our YouTube channel as well. Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P on YouTube. Okay, so you get maximum exposure. You get audio podcast exposure. You get Facebook and 
YouTube. Okay. Uh, okay, I want to learn half day law argument. Sure enough. Okay, Linda said, not exactly sure what you were trying to say. Yes, thinking about the end game, more of us should think that way, uh, Kesha said. Right. Okay. Look, hey guys, we got to get out of here. Remember, the African History Network we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct wrong behavior. Let me post the link to the also the article from uh, uh, History.com dealing with uh, Louisiana Purchase. Uh, the Louisiana Purchase was driven by a slave rebellion. Okay. Remember, right now, it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. Wakanda forever. We'll talk to you next time. Peace.